Turn with me in your Bibles, the book of Jude. We are in a relatively short series that we started last week in the very short book of Jude, which is at the end of your New Testaments, so the very end of your Bibles. The last book is Revelation. If you find that, go forward or backward, I guess, backward, one book. You're at Jude. It's probably only a page long, so don't miss it. Some of you turn or swipe or just type it in, then you can't miss it, J-U-D-E. But we're going to look at a little bit longer passage than we did last week. We're looking at verses 5 through 16. Now, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who did not stay within their own positions of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all the day, all, blaspheme all that they do not understand. And they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts, as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, Fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. Wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame. Wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loudmouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. That's some harsh words. It was a, a Friday in early May. Europe was engaged in a massive war. And we remember probably, some of us remember, the seminal events from our high school history classes. There was the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria, which took place in Sarajevo. And nation after nation uh, assembled against one another as a number of secret treaties for mutual defense were called upon. Russia and France ready to defend Serbia while German came to the aid, Germany came to the aid of Austria. And by fall of that year, Britain had entered the war, but it was not truly a world war until that Friday in May. On May 7th, 1915, the RMS Lusitania was traveling between Britain and the United States. The ocean liner had at one time been the world's largest. It was fast, and that made it a great passenger vessel for wartime especially when primitive submarines, the German U-boats, were luring in British, lurking in British waters to sink unsuspecting boats that might support the war effort. The Lusitania had left New York for Liverpool. The British government sent warnings about the presence of U-boats in the waters. The Lusitania was advised to stay far away from the shore and travel in a zigzagging pattern as it approached Britain. For reasons we don't know, the captain of the vessel ignored those warnings. Perhaps he was confident in his vessel's speed and size to make it unscathed. But whatever the case, the German U-20 struck with a torpedo. And in just 18 minutes, the Lusitania sank 11 miles off Ireland, killing nearly 1,200 passengers, about two-thirds of the manifest. 
Included were many Americans, of course, and it's widely regarded as the singular event that drew the United States out of its isolationism and into the war on the side of Britain and France. How history might have been different had that captain heeded the warnings? It's impossible to know. Would the United States have even gotten into the war? Would they have joined the opposite side? It's amazing to think how much destruction and devastation hinged on some very urgent advice that was unheeded. Have you ever heard some scandalous news and just written it off as impossibly true, impossibly untrue, just ignored advice that was given to you, heeded no warning, and instead pursued your own course. I don't know why this is <laughs> sticking on me today, but such is the case in the book of Jude. As we looked last week at the introduction to the book, we saw that Jude had a warning, and he was urging his readers to contend for the faith because it might get upset. Well, here in verses 5 through 16, Jude wants to bring out the threat with a little bit more clarity. And he wants to persuade them that this is a threat they cannot ignore. Because what Jude would remind us even today is there may be some in our ranks who are fit to be destroyed. And so we need to heed the warning. And Jude looks at this. It's pretty obvious in, in the text in front of us. There's three paragraphs there. That is a nice fit. He shows us a past pattern, a present pattern, and then warns us of the plan for those who are so patterned. A past pattern, a present pattern and a plan for the pattern. Jude's a difficult book. As we were reading it, there was probably some things you heard that are strange and and odd, and we're going to dig into them a little bit. It depends so heavily on the Old Testament, Jude does, that many of us haven't read those parts, and we haven't read those parts well, as we should. Um, But Jude confounds us even more by citing some works that aren't even in the Bible. But these allusions remind us that despite Jude's concern for his readers, they share a common culture and they share a common understanding of the scriptures that he can appeal to. In looking at the first few verses of Jude, we saw last week that there was a charge to contend for the faith. His readers were experiencing a threat to the true Christian faith that seemed as much about orthopraxy, having the right actions or works, as it had to do with orthodoxy, having the right beliefs. In verses 5 through 16, Jude makes the case that the concerns he has brought to their intention are, in fact, real. And he begins by appealing to Scripture to show his readers something about how God has acted in the past. Some Christians read the Bible as if the Old Testament and the New Testament were completely different works with different expectations. Some of us are probably tempted to read the Bible. We we just focus on the New Testament. We think the Old Testament is old. It's it's outdated. It's no longer relevant or useful. It doesn't apply to us. But nothing could be further from the truth. And for Jude, the way God operated under the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, is the way he operates in the New Covenant. So we'll turn to verses uh, 5 through 7. And we'll see that Jude wants to impress three historical events on the minds of his audience. And each is worth dwelling on for a minute before we see what he's doing with them. So we're looking at this past pattern that he wants to present to us. We're going to look at each briefly and then kind of pull the three together. He writes in verse 5, Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. In the Old Testament, God first rescued Jacob and his sons as, and their families by bringing them into the land of Egypt. But over a period of about 400 years, 
They became slaves in Egypt. They were mistreated and they were abused. But God's patience for Egypt wears out. And in a spectacular display of power, he frees them from Egypt, forms them into a new nation, Israel, and leads them to a new land. It's a bit of an aside, but we have to touch on it. it what's, remarkable about Jude's, what's remarkable about Jude's words here is the question of who rescued the people from the land of Egypt. Jude says it was Jesus. And everywhere in the Old Testament, it's Yahweh, or Jehovah if you prefer, who delivers his people out of Egypt. And what Jude writes here is tantamount to saying that Jesus is the embodiment of Yahweh. Yahweh, the one and only God, beside whom there is no other, is to be identified precisely with Jesus. These are building blocks of the Trinity, the, the idea that God is one. There is one God who exists eternally in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that is the only God there is. But let's get to Jude's point. Despite the fact that God brought Israel out of Egypt by his mighty hand, he nonetheless destroyed many of those very same Israelites because they didn't believe, they didn't have faith. Jude could be thinking of a couple different stories, or he could be conflating a couple of those stories together because there was more than one incident. But perhaps the most audacious example of this was in Exodus 32 at the foot of Mount Sinai. Moses goes up to receive the Ten Commandments, and the Israelites grew tired of waiting for him. They made golden idols and held a feast to this false god. They disbelieved the one true God. And as a result, God destroyed several thousand of them. Let's look at the second example Jude mentions. Jude 6 says, And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. That's a strange little tidbit. But his readers would have known that he was almost certainly referring to Genesis 6. And unfortunately for me this morning, that's another really difficult text. Um, let me read the beginning of Genesis 6. You can turn there if you want. You don't need to. Um, so that we understand the background for what Jude is saying. In, in Genesis chapter 6, first four verses read this way. When man began to multiply on the face of the earth, or the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Genesis describes a dark time in human history when wickedness was increasing just before the account of Noah. Noah and the flood and, and God purifies his creation by wiping out sin. And in those days leading up to it, something scandalous happens, and, and these so-called sons of God had sexual relations with so-called daughters of men. The second one's easy. The daughters of man are women. That's easy enough. And the sons of God are angels. There's a few other theories that float around out there about who they are, but all the biblical evidence points to the fact that they are angels. If you want to dig into it, we can grab coffee later in the week, but I'm not, we'd we'll be here all morning. Um, it's weird. It's strange. It offends our sensibilities. And it happened. And Jude sums it up this way, the angels did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling. They had a high and exalted place in the heavenly realms. They abandoned that to apparently take on human form and use that for base and evil purposes. The angels were God's ministering servants. 
They were without sin, and yet some of them rebelled in a corruption of human sexuality. And Jude says they are now being restrained until a final judgment comes. We could say a lot more on that. But we're going to leave it there because that's all Jude says. And it's easier for me. But um, The third incident, the third historical past pattern that Jude wants to point out is in verse 7. Just as, so he likens them to this angelic situation, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desires, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Now we have this much more famous case of Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities. Um, it was more than just the two, although those are the two that we remember. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah were clearly guilty of innumerable detestable sins, but on the day that God is prepared to judge them, they demonstrate their wickedness in a shocking fashion. God sends angels... And as you can read this in Genesis, God sends angels who appear as men to rescue a man named Lot and Lot's family because Lot has faith. Even though it may be weak, Lot has faith. And the righteous are righteous on account of their faith. And not knowing that Lot's visitors are angels as opposed to men, the men of the, the town demand that Lot hand over these guests so they can violate them. And as Jude puts it, they, like the angels in the last story, perverted God's design for sexuality. In Sodom's case, it was rape and a desire for same-sex relations, which Jude calls unnatural desire or desire for other flesh. It'd be a little more literal translation. They two were destroyed and will face eternal punishment in hell. So what's the connection between these three stories? Rather simply, I think, we have a group of people in each case who outwardly might appear to have things together or at least have some things going for them. Israel in the first. They were, weren't they God's chosen people? The one that God exerted great power to draw out of Egypt? Angels in the second, God's ministering servants, and they, they beheld his very glory. Uh, in the third, you have these significant towns in, in the valleys of Palestine. In each case, there was righteousness mixed with unrighteousness, faithfulness mixed with unfaithfulness. And in each case... Unbelievers, even with horrendous perversions of the truth, existed alongside faithful believers. And when the time came, God separated them and destroyed them. So here's the point. Jude said, as we discussed last week, contend for the faith. Because there are those who have snuck into your camp snuck into your churches and are a threat to you and themselves. That was the message last week. But if you were in Jude's audience, you could imagine you might have been incredulous. No, Jude, that can't be right. Sure, we have some problems in our church. It's, it, it's not perfect. We're not perfect. We're all sinners here. But, but there's nothing that serious going on, Jude. Okay, maybe we have some individuals, Jude, who, who need a little more instruction or could use a little more care with their words. But their heart is in the right place, Jude. They're passionate about Jesus. After all, don't we reason the same way? And here's Jude's warning. It happened in history. Even in some, it, some, to some individuals, you'd think it was never possible to Israelites fresh out of seeing God part the Red Sea, to angels fresh out of beholding God's glory. If it can happen to them, he says it can happen to you. And that means that we need to be introspective. We need to be uh, introspective as a community, and we need to be introspective as individuals. We need to check our own selves. In 2 Corinthians uh, 
chapter 3, verse 15, Paul writes, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you check yourself? Do you ever ask, am I really a Christian? Am I really regenerated by the Holy Spirit? Do I truly trust in Christ's sacrifice? Or am I like those whom John wrote, many believed in his name, but Jesus did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people, for he himself knew what was in man. There's a kind of belief that really isn't faith. As some have said, if you are arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict? But we also have to be introspective as a community. Jude is just writing to a community. He's writing to a group. Everything's plural here. And we don't want to be paranoid about one another. We don't want to be heresy hunters, always looking for who doesn't belong here. But we also can't be a people that willfully overlook serious, outward, unrepentant sin. We can't be people who turn a blind eye to individuals teaching things that contradict the fundamental truths of the Christian faith. And in 2018, I think we can extend the idea of community a bit from Gateway Church downtown. Because modern communication is the, has made the world so incredibly small. Uh, for Jude's audience, these false teachers had to creep into their community physically. But that's not the case anymore. There are movements and groups that can infiltrate our ranks or our hearts through a blog or a YouTube video, even though we've never known them personally. And so we can't be passive Christians. We can't consume just anything that has a Christian label on it. We have to test and hold on to the good and throw away the bad. But let's look ahead to what these intruders look like more specifically and see what might resonate for us. So the present pattern or the present moment of these people that fit the past pattern in verses 8 through 13. And Jude begins verse 8, yet in like manner. In other words, he's saying that these guys fit the past pattern. They're presently patterned after those who came before. And in verse 8, he gives a short summary of what he sees as these guys' sins. These people, relying on dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. Three things. And Jude fills them out a bit in the next couple verses. I want to pause for a moment on the idea that they rely on their dreams. It, it might be better to say that Jude just calls them dreamers. In the ancient world, it was not uncommon for individuals to claim spiritual import for their dreams, to view dreams as a way that God communicated revelation to them. In fact, we see a couple instances in the Old Testament, though two of the most significant examples happened to unbelievers, Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar. And while the Bible does say a few positive things uh, about them, about God-given dreams, the whole scope of the Old Testament and New Testament when it comes to dreamers is fairly suspicious in general of those claiming to have dreams, giving them revelation about what to do or how to live. Now, that mostly went silent during the Christian period, but... In recent decades, the phenomenon of Christians relying on dreams has exploded. And it's safe to say that we should be, at the very least, extremely cautious. Now, their dreaming led them to three sins. Hit them all briefly. Defiling the flesh meant indulging in physical pleasures in a way that was not intended by God. It could have been gluttony, could have been dark drunkenness, could have been narcotics, which did exist in the ancient world. It certainly would have included, and most likely did include in this context, sexual relations outside of marriage. So that's sin number one. 
Sin number two is that they reject authority. And while that's tempting as a person in authority to say, ah, they don't listen to people like me. That's not, I think, however, what, what Jude means. He's not, he's not talking about himself. He's not talking about pastors. He's not talking about the government. The word for authority here is related to the word Lord. It means authority in the sense of lordship. And since Jude has already written in verse 4 that these individuals deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ, what he probably means here is that they reject Jesus' authority. They reject Jesus' lordship. In, in the middle of the 20th century, lasting until today, but thankfully fading a bit. It's not gone, though. There was a simplified version of Christianity that went something like this. Simply believe in Jesus and you'll go to heaven forever. That was the, the sum of it. Or just ask Jesus into your heart and you'll be forgiven of all your sins, even the ones you've not committed yet. The heart of the message is good. I'm not, I'm not complaining about the heart of that message. It's the just part that can be a bit misconstrued. Uh, and in fact, it was. Some teachers actively taught that you become a Christian when you believe, and then later on in your Christian life, hopefully, you make Jesus your Lord, your King, your Master, and you submit to him. But those were two different things. So you could be saved, and you could go to heaven, and you could be a Christian, believing in Jesus, but not ever submitting to him as Lord. And that's just not what the Bible teaches. What the Bible teaches is that we must accept Jesus as Lord. That's the only kind of belief, the only kind of faith that Jesus is interested in. It's the kind of faith that believes in him for what he's done and who he is and what he is. It's not enough to merely believe in Jesus if your belief isn't the sort of belief that calls Jesus my Lord and my Master and seeks to humbly submit to him in every aspect of your life. We know in this life there will be sin. And in this life that means that we will be doing a lot of repenting. But make no mistake, if you are a Christian, Jesus bought you with a price of his blood. He died on a cross for your sins that you can be set free from sin and from death. And he makes demands on us. And those who believe must be people who trust that he is good, trust that he is right, and repent of their sins. Which means to turn your back on them and start living differently. If you're stuck in a habitual pattern of sin, there's some sin in your life that you haven't turned your back on and rejected it. It might be that you are actually rejecting the lordship of Jesus in the same way these false Christians in Jude's day rejected the lordship of Jesus. You know that Jesus has certain demands, but you refuse to bow to those demands... And so by your lifestyle, you show that you have rejected his rightful authority over you. You cannot be saved to serve yourself. That's not the Christian message. You're saved to serve a new master. Doesn't mean you'll be perfect. But if you're indulging a habitual pattern of sin, whatever it is, I'm worried for you. Examine yourself. Test yourself. Are you really in the faith? Third sin, they blasphemed glorious one, which apparently means they talked lightly or spoke ill of fallen angels, what we might call demons, demonic powers. It's possible Jude's talking about good angels. I, I think the context lends more to evil angels. But why would they do this in any case? It seems like a strange thing to do. Um, well, for any number of reasons that are lost to us in history I could, that I could imagine, what we can say is that um, 
I've seen, I'm sure we've all seen Christians and so-called Christians claim to be very knowledgeable about heavenly things. And really, they're pretty ignorant. And sometimes they say silly things in their arrogance, and perhaps that's the problem here. Perhaps they're so confident in their false holiness that they don't believe that evil spirits can harm them in any way, so they've taken to saying awful things about them. Whatever the case, Jude wants to retort these sins, and he wants to address that sin of bad-mouthing angels first, and he writes... Uh, but when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. The story doesn't come from the Old Testament, and it comes most likely from a book called The Assumption of Moses that would have been in circulation in the first century. It was lost to history until the 1800s uh, when we discovered some ancient copies of it. Um, Jude isn't quoting it to say that the book was true, and that we should believe everything in it. The Apostle Paul, after all, quoted Greek poets and didn't assume that everything those poets said was good. But this was a story that illustrated Jude's point, and it would have been well known to his audience. Uh, perhaps Jude felt the basic contours of the story were true. But when Moses died in the Old Testament, the Bible simply states that God buried him. No one knew any other details. We don't know where. We don't know when. We don't know how. There was no grave marking Moses's, uh, no gravestone marking his burial place. And what the assumption of Moses described was that Satan wanted to take Moses's body, since Moses was a sinner and unworthy of a dignified burial. And the archangel Michael set out to give Moses a dignified burial. So, in other words, Michael was the agent of God's burying activity. But rather than speak ill of Satan directly, he called on God, the Lord, to rebuke Satan. It's a strange story. But Jude's point in using this story is that if the highest, most glorified angel, Michael, refused to blaspheme the most despicable and evil of all angels, Satan, how much more inappropriate was it for these people to be doing what they were doing? And Jude's contention is that they are ignorant and like stupid beasts who can only reason by instinct, they will be destroyed by the very things they pursue. And, and Jude seems to be alluding again to their fleshly pursuits, that first sin. And, and though they seem arrogant and overconfident, they're ignorant. And their ignorance of true spirituality leads them to pursue lifestyles consumed by what is enjoyable and pleasurable to their bodies. And there's a warning here. And the warning is that there may be many individuals who presume to know a lot about spiritual matters and spiritual things, but their lifestyles betray their ignorance. And so Jude pronounces woe on them. Woe to them, for they walk in the way of Cain and abandon themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. Pronouncing woe was like a, it was an old way of saying watch out because utter doom is coming to you. The reasons? Well, again, Jude takes three examples from the Old Testament. Cain, who murdered his brother Abel. Balaam, who took money from the king of Bashan to prophesy curses over the nation of Israel. And Korah, who led a rebellion of supposedly faithful Israelites against Moses. Cain was jealous of his brother Abel and bitter at Abel's favored status before God because Abel had been righteous and he had not been. Balaam was greedy and motivated by money and Korah was jealous that Moses was treated as special when all the Israelites were God's people. Each one in his own way desired something that wasn't rightfully his. Each one craved and longed for something he shouldn't have and tried to take it for himself. In short, they lived for themselves. They lived for what felt good. They lived for pleasure and their own joy. And in each case, it ruined them. Jude concludes this section with some choice descriptions of these individuals. Hidden reefs at your love feasts, 
as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. This is one of the most powerful word pictures in the, <laughs> frankly, in the entire Bible. Jude leaves the lasting image of the utter disaster these individuals are. Consider each one of these pictures calls them hidden reefs at their love feasts. The, the love feasts were early Christian community meals. They were often, if not always, followed by or incorporated somehow the Lord's Supper. So they, they were celebrating the Lord's Supper, the wine and the bread from a, from a very early time. And they combined it with a larger community meal. So as such, these were special meals that were only for Christians, only for the church. And Judas scandalized that these individuals are taking part in these church-only meals with impunity. Hidden reefs were a danger to any ship. The sharp coral line just under the surface of the water could tear a ship apart. It was sneaky, and it was a deadly danger. And it's a reminder that we as Christians have an obligation to guard the Lord's Supper. To not simply indulge everyone who wants to take the body and blood of our Lord. In different cultures and time, that's taken different forms. Uh, recently, the elders have been discussing how we can do a better job of this here at Gateway. Um, but whatever the case, we as a church have an obligation to ensure there are no hidden reefs. Especially in our celebration of the Lord's Supper, when we celebrate coming together as one body and one church in Christ. Jude calls them shepherds feeding themselves. The Bible consistently uses the picture of a shepherd as the ideal leader, tending the sheep, feeding the sheep, caring for sheep, binding up broken sheep, leading sheep to water, chasing off threatening predators, seeking lost sheep. It's why the word shepherd is chosen as a description of the work of an elder or an overseer in the New Testament. It's where we get the word pastor in English. The idea of the shepherd that tended to his own needs rather than a flock would have been abhorrent. It would have been the very definition of a bad and worthless leader. And yet today we see these so-called shepherds. We see these so-called pastors who are feeding themselves. They're filthy rich while their constituents are filthy in destitution. Some of them have the nerve to travel to the poorest regions of the world to rob from the poor and fill their pockets. They drive vehicles that cost six figures and fly eight-figure private planes, stay in the most luxurious hotels and live in the most luxurious mansions. And while that might be a small number, there are many more. I wish it weren't true. But there are many more who aspire to that level of success. Wicked men and women. And yet, they don't arrive in that position by looking like Satan incarnate. They arrive in that position because they look good. They sound good. They're hidden reefs. He calls them waterless clouds, which would have been useless to an agricultural society like Israel that depended on every drop of rain in a time before fertilizers and drought-resistant uh, genetically modified plants for our fields. Fruitless trees and laid on them. No fruit when it's well past time for fruit, useless, worthless, wild waves of the sea. Ever, ever see how the ocean can lap the shore with a foamy, disgusting junk? That's how Jude sees them in that church. Wandering stars, essentially they're planets. That's what they call planets, wanderers. That's where we get the word from. And, and from our perspective on earth, 
the planets don't follow a fixed path in the sky. And so for navigation and getting around in the ancient world, they were worthless. When we put them all together, we get a dire picture. These false teachers that, have so, that they have so far put up with are anything but safe. They fit the pattern that we saw in the Old Testament. Their lifestyles demonstrate that they have unbelieving hearts. And just like there were unbelieving hearts mixed with the believing ones in the past, there will be mixes in the present. Jesus himself spoke of the kingdom being like a, a field, a field of wheat in which an enemy comes along and sows weeds among the wheat. And at an early age, as they're growing up, they look the same. But as they mature and begin to ripen, it's clear that something else is going on. Jesus likens it to there being a, a net of fish from the ocean. And in the net of fish, there are some catfish and there's some carp. Sometimes you pull up the net and you get both. But he'll throw away the carp. He likens it to sheep and goats. That sometimes in a flock, the sheep and the goats are kept together. But in the end, he says, I will separate the goats from the sheep. The question before us then is, do we see these false teachers today? Well, I think by God's grace, Jude doesn't give us all the details of their practice or their teaching. And I say by God's grace because if Jude had said, these are exactly what they're teaching, these five doctrinal points, and their, their actions are these six or seven things exactly over here, then our temptation would be to say, oh, we don't see anybody teaching those exact five things and doing those seven things over there, so we don't have a problem with that, Jude. No, he, he generally gives us kind of the outline, the broad pictures of what these guys look like. He gives us the pattern. They pursue their own cravings and lusts, and they call it good. And by their lifestyles, they deny Jesus' lordship over them. In other words, they live how they want because they claim they're free from the consequences of sin. And they speak ignorantly because of spiritual things because they're ignorant of the Bible or because those things haven't been revealed to us. So you got the pattern. We can be on the lookout for it. And I think we've already seen a few ways in which this is quite alive and well. In the very last section, Jude references another ancient document outside the Bible, a text called First Enoch. He uses this text to demonstrate God's plan for those who are so patterned. This was a, a writing which was supposedly written by Enoch, the great, 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 great-grandson of Adam, but which probably everyone knew, even in the first century, was not written by Enoch. Still, it was, a, it was a body of writing that was in circulation at the time. It was held in esteem in many Jewish communities, even if it didn't rise to the level of Scripture. And I understand there's a lot of tricky questions in there. I'm not going to address them in this sermon, except to say, again, Jude's inclusion of material familiar to his readers doesn't mean he accepted or endorsed everything in first Enoch as authoritative certainly not in the same way that he would have uh, read Genesis or Isaiah but he apparently saw this passage as valuable for its teaching it was also about these that Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied saying behold the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. But these are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They're loudmouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. I like to use that word ungodly a lot. Um, and Enoch's prophecy, the Lord comes with his holy angels and destroys those ungodly individuals. God will convict, it says, of every single deed of ungodliness. There's no little ones that escape punishment. 
There's no minor sins that get overlooked. And because of that, it is imperative that we know a Lord, that we have a Savior who is competent to save. And those who turn to Jesus in this faith and true repentance will escape that judgment. The sinful deeds that Jude has particularly in mind for these false teachers are much of what we've said, but he adds a little. They're grumblers and malcontents. Here, probably not so much other people as with how God is revealed in Scripture. When they hear what this God truly asks of them and demands, they read the pages of Scripture, or if they heard Scripture read to them, maybe they complain about it as if God has somehow been burdensome to them or inconvenienced in them, them in some way. That's just, that's just hard. They'd rather follow their own sinful desires. It's easier that way. The last descriptions suggest that they're always shooting their mouths off, talking in the biggest possible terms to win admirers, not for the sake of good, but for their own advantage, whether it's financially or, or socially. It's often the case, isn't it, that some of the most dangerous individuals are some of the nicest. They're, they're smooth tongues and, and flattering words draw us in and make us want to trust them. But it's a reminder that we have to test everything by Scripture. We have to go back to the source. This is where we have to place our trust. This is God's revealed word to us. I confess that there's once in a while, there's, there's still some things I, I come to that I don't fully grasp the whys of. Well, I mean, when I get to the whys part, um, there's probably a lot of things that I don't fully understand. Because I don't have the mind of God. And God is, he's a good God. He often explains things for us. But he's not under any obligation to always explain everything for us. As Paul put it, doesn't the potter have the right to do with the clay as he wants? I am the servant. He is the Lord. And sometimes that means I do things. Just, just the way all of us do things at work. Maybe some of you are self-employed, but you have a boss. You have somebody who tells you to do something. And sometimes you don't always understand the whys or the hows of it, but you do it because... Well, he's the boss. Differently with God, though, he's always good. He's always loving. You know that if you're his, that he always has your best in mind. He promises that he works all things together for the good of those who love him. And so you can say, I know that's me. And so even if I don't understand why this is good for me or how this is going to be good for those around me, I'm going to do it anyways because I know he's good. And so when these flatterers come around, when these guys come around with their dreams, when these guys come around with their ideas about how they can live their lives, when we are seeing people that are confronted by Scripture, confronted by the Word of God, and they don't want to do anything about the way their life is not in line with it, then we need to be careful. Because the reality is, is, not only are they up for destruction, and the Bible says they are, but if they are a hidden reef, then that means they are a threat to our faith. They're a threat to those that we love, our children, our, our spouses, our friends. And we can't tolerate this type of heresy. I think we are blessed here at Gateway. Um, first of all, let, let me preface this by saying if you ever, ever, ever see anything of this sort come from me, remove me from my office that day. If you ever see it in Brian, 
or any other elder we call, you remove us from our office that day. You call a special meeting for the terms of the Constitution and you get us removed because we are unfit to lead. We're congregational here. So the members have that power. They can do that. I hope and pray I'm not. But that's, that's your call. I do think we're, we're blessed. And, and I think we're blessed in that we have been protected. We have been spared a bit from some of the more treacherous um, elements that these false teachers have had. But again, my concern isn't so much the members inside Gateway as in a very small world, the influences that can easily creep in unnoticed without even being physically present. And so brothers and sisters, I would, I would challenge you, test, test the things that you're reading. Test the things that you're listening to. Test the, the speakers that you hear in your spare time. Even as I, I demand, I, I beg that you test me by this, that we be true to this, be true to what God has already spoken. And if anyone comes along, because they're out there and they're near, and if anyone comes along and says, I, I have a revelation from God, I have a dream, God wants this for us, God wants that from us, say, where is that in God's word? Because this is how God has spoken to me, faithfully and truthfully, day after day, year after year. So show me here. Show me here. What gives you the right to live your life that way? Show me here. Why is your life not look like this? What's going on? What do you need to turn away from? What do you need to be careful of? Let's be careful too that one little bit of Coral on our shore doesn't grow into a giant submerged reef either. It's a reminder of why, as Paul says, we put sin to death in our members. We actively fight it. Let's be vigilant. Let's pray.